the Killer Cases podcast contains content explicit in nature. Please proceed with caution. Depending on who you ask, the case we are examining today could be classified as a case of serial murder or a case of terrorism. There are also those that say the case of the Shankill Butchers is clearly both. One thing is certain, although the Shankill Butchers are the most prolific group of serial killers in the history of the United Kingdom, few outside of the UK are familiar with this story. It is this reason, coupled with my fascination for the history of the Troubles, that led to this being the first episode of Killer Cases. Tonight, we will consider statements made by a number of individuals that were close to the Butcher's case. Detective Chief Inspector Jimmy Nesbitt, journalist Jim Campbell, and author Martin Dillon are a few of those and I mention them here because I believe it is important to point out the contribution these men have made in pursuing the story of the Shankill Butchers. This is an important case for us right now because the sectarian violence and corruption in Northern Ireland during this time period should draw parallels for listeners to what is happening in our world today. Sectarian violence fuels every major conflict on Earth right now, so no matter where you are, Relating to these individuals who lived in absolute fear of the Shankill Butchers may not be that difficult. So that these killings can be viewed through the appropriate lens, our story begins with a brief look at what was happening in Northern Ireland in the years leading up to the first Butchers murders. April 1966. Northern Ireland has been enjoying relative peace, but the burgeoning civil rights movement that would officially form a year later was causing some people in the Protestant community to feel that remaining on their current course with Stormont, the Northern Irish government, would result in Northern Ireland being handed over to the Republic of Ireland. You might be asking yourself, why would this be a bad thing? Well, in 1966 Northern Ireland, the Protestant enjoyed a much more privileged life than Catholics and feared that the tables would be turned. This paranoia led to the rise of a man named Ian Paisley, a Protestant preacher. Paisley found the UCDC, or the Ulster Constitution Defense Committee, to oppose the civil rights movement and protect the Constitution of Northern Ireland which Paisley claimed the IRA was trying to destroy. Paisley was quoted as saying, The whole Civil Rights Association is a front movement for the destruction of the Constitution of Northern Ireland. The leadership of the Civil Rights Movement, represented by John Hume, disagreed with Paisley's claim about their intention to destroy the Constitution. Hume could be quoted as saying, The Civil Rights Movement most emphatically, is not out to upset the Constitution of Northern Ireland. We're out for civil rights, for equal rights, for all citizens under the Constitution. In fact, we are testing the strength of this Constitution. Shortly after, on the 21st of May, the Loyalist Ulster Volunteer Force, or UVF, declared war on the Irish Republican Army who they believed were behind the civil rights movement. UVF leaders believed that the civil rights movement would be a breeding ground for the IRA and that a revival of the IRA was almost certain if the movement continued to gain unopposed momentum. Less than two weeks later, the UVF carried out the first of a spate of killings of Catholic civilians. 
If we fast forward to the first civil rights march in Northern Ireland on the 24th of August, two years after the UVF attacks spanning the months of May and June, and the Irish Republican Army still had not carried out any major retribution operations in response. Paranoia and prejudice, though, are a toxic mix. Loyalists carried out attacks on many of the marches throughout Northern Ireland, and where it did not, organized counter-demonstrations in attempt to get the marches banned. In Derry, the Loyalist Apprentice Boys succeeded in doing that on October 5th that year. Announcing their intention to stage a counter-protest the same day, Stormont declared a ban on all marches taking place. The ban was just what many on the Republican side of the demonstrations wanted. When the Catholic Republicans and their supporters defied the ban and marched anyway, the Royal Ulster Constabulary the official police force of Northern Ireland and an important piece of our story, would be forced to respond in a manner that was almost sure to make the defiant protesters out to be martyrs in the global press, and this would put pressure on the Stormont government to act. As a result of over 100 people being injured, including many of Northern Ireland's own MPs, or members of Parliament, who could be seen being beaten on the streets with batons without provocation. This led to two days of rioting between the Republicans and the Royal Ulster Constabulary in Derry. Just two days after the rioting ended, a student march planned to protest police brutality in response to the events of October 5th was met and blocked by Paisley-led loyalists. 1969 would mark the turning point in the Troubles, with virtually every civil rights march being attacked repeatedly by Loyalists. Off-duty police officers with their Royal Ulster Constabulary would often participate in the violence, alongside Loyalist paramilitaries. In fact, it would later come to light that many members of the Royal Ulster Constabulary were members of the UVF and were loyal to it first. Determined to sink O'Neill's current Stormont government, Ulster loyalists staged false flag attacks and placed the blame on the IRA. Six bombings were carried out on hydroelectric power plants, and as a result, troops were sent to guard them. Despite the attacks being carried out by loyalists, it seemed the Protestant community was willing to accept the narrative that the attacks were carried out by the Republicans and support took a nosedive for O'Neill, who resigned on the 28th of April that year. Rumors among the two communities led authorities to suspect that the preacher, Ian Paisley, was behind the attacks. Evidence uncovered years later would support the claim that Ian Paisley financed the attacks and his personal driver participated in their execution. Publicly, Paisley could not deny his association with the attackers, saying that he could not control the actions of his parishioners. Nothing ever came of the evidence of Paisley's involvement in the killings, however, and Paisley would go on to serve as an MP and eventually the First Minister of Northern Ireland. And it was the very same year that riding in Belfast brings the eventual leader and mastermind of the Shanko Butcher's gang, Lenny Murphy, to join the Ulster Volunteer Force at the age of 16. From August the 12th to the 16th of 1969, Murphy was actively involved in sectarian violence with the UVF, and it is surmised that Murphy may have committed murders during these riots. Indeed, a deep hatred for Catholics did fuel much of the actions of the UVF over the course of the Troubles, but Lenny Murphy's hatred of the Catholics was something else to behold. One of the men that we mentioned as a major contributor to the case, writer Martin Dillon, 
suggested that it was because Murphy was a Catholic name that the Murphys were shunned in the Protestant community. It's believed that this led to Murphy's unique hatred, known to refer to Catholics as scum and animals in regular conversation. In January 1970, the UBF would finally have the official armed opponent that they had been expecting for years when the provisional IRA was formed in a bar in Ireland. This was not good news for the UVF because they had a shortage of weapons and manpower to patrol their own streets. That led to the rise of Protestant vigilante groups like the Shankill Butchers, who were still several years from their formation at this point in time. In short order, the UVF and Protestant vigilante groups would form a confederation of sorts and name it the Ulster Defense Association. The UDA could not keep up with the quick growth of the provisional IRA. Nostalgia for the Republican nationalist cause had returned to Northern Ireland, and the provisional IRA was soon able to set its sights on an armed campaign against the British military with the end goal of British withdrawal from Northern Ireland. The UDA instead set its sights on attacking Catholic civilians in North Belfast, with the intended effect proving that the IRA could not protect its own community. Meanwhile, 1970 to 1971 are important years for our bloody psychopath, as he is later called, Lenny Murphy. Surrounding himself with many of the people that would go on to be in his gang during the years of the butcher murders, Lenny Murphy and his goons began to make a name for themselves. Murphy spent much of his time at a slew of bars on the Shank Hill Road and even recruited members into the UVF. The various vigilante groups in the UDA, however, were also attempting to form their own paramilitaries outside the UVF, and many of the vigilante groups controlled areas within Protestant neighborhoods. With membership in both the UDA and UVF, Murphy jumped at every chance he got to participate in violence. By this time, there were areas that Catholics and Protestants, respectively, could not afford to travel within North Belfast. Walking on certain public routes could identify your religious affiliation just based on the direction you were walking, and this became a tactic used by Protestant vigilante groups like the Shankill Butchers to identify victims. 1972 is a watershed year for both the IRA Arm Campaign and Lenny Murphy. On January 30th, what has since become known as Bloody Sunday, peaceful civil rights marches protesting the internment of Republicans without trial were gunned down by a British Army Parachute Regiment. This was significant because, up until that point, much of the Catholic community regarded the British Army as their protectors against the UDA and the Royal Ulster Constabulary. The events of January 30th caused a groundswell of support within the provisional IRA, and many Catholics turned against the British Army. But for Lenny Murphy, 1972 would mark the year that he began to get away with murder. Literally. When the dissident Republicans began to be interned, the leadership of the UBF never dreamed that the internment law would be used on them. But sure enough, the internment of many of the senior leadership in the UDA and the UDF would pave the way for the likes of Lenny Murphy and his muscle, Basher Bates and Sam McAllister, in Loyalist paramilitary groups. While Murphy was rising in the Protestant paramilitary world, Stormont, the Northern Irish government, was rumored to be on its way to being abolished. This led to increased fear among the Protestant community that if Stormont were indeed abolished, they would likely be handed over to the Republic of Ireland. When Stormont did fall, it dealt heavy, some say irreparable damage to the collective Protestant psyche. And many believe this was their signal that the time for talk was over and that someone must act on behalf of their community. Lenny Murphy, by now totally immersed in the paramilitary and vigilante lifestyle, 
was involved in the killings of four Catholic men early that year. But it is Lenny's arrest, along with Mervyn Connor, for the murder of a fellow Protestant named William Edward Pavis, that we begin to see how Lenny Murphy was able to get away with the murders for as long as he did. William Edward Pavis was killed at his home in East Belfast after spending the day hunting with a Catholic priest. Many in the Protestant paramilitary community believed he was selling weapons to the IRA. It is believed that Pavis was killed by Murphy and Connor for this very reason. Connor and Murphy were held in prison together before their trial, and after Murphy was picked out in a lineup by two witnesses, Connor would make a confession that implicated Murphy in the murders. However, before the trial started in April of 1973, Connor would eventually be found to have committed suicide with cyanide, and before doing so, penned a letter exonerating Murphy of a role in the attack. Now, for the first time, we look at a statement made by the man who would hunt Murphy and his gang of butchers longer than anyone else, Detective Chief Inspector Jimmy Nesbitt. Murphy was a very, very extremely cunning man who could adapt to any circumstances in which he found himself. Murphy probably threatened to kill him if he didn't do it. He was totally ruthless and sadistic, and if he had been involved in the murders he was expected of, of Pavis and Connors, then he would be capable of almost anything, and it was common knowledge that Murphy was responsible for Connors' death. Murphy would still be tried in the death of Pavis, but he was ultimately acquitted because it was found that a disturbance he caused in the police lineup had tainted the identification made by the two witnesses. Murphy would, however, stay in prison from 1973 to 1975 for attempting escape, but less than three years after contributing to the deaths of as many as six men, Murphy was back on the Shankill. Murphy would go to work almost immediately recruiting and planning for the butcher murders, which were also known as the cutthroat murders. Most notably, former associates Basher Bates and Sam McAllister would be joined by one more, William Moore. These three men comprised the inner circle of Murphy's gang, and it is believed that Murphy's brother John also played an important role. The total size of the Butcher gang is estimated to be around 20 members by the start of the killings. There was a horrendous wound in the throat of the man. The blood was still oozing. It was absolutely grotesque. He was attacked, hit over the head, and put into a waiting car before being driven to an alleyway on the Shankill Road where his throat was cut. It was different. It was, it was so savage, so barbaric. We had come across people stabbed, attacks with knives. This man had obviously been overpowered and his throat deliberately slid open. Evil is the only way you could describe it. Just evil. Detective Chief Inspector Jimmy Nesbitt describes his memory of the scene of the murder of Francis Crossan. When asked if the police had any leads, Nesbitt replied, We went through every possible line of inquiry. There was no one about. There was no one about, and that was why he was abducted. This meant that if Nesbitt was going to get any information on Crossan, it would have to come from someone involved in the act. With hindsight being 2020 and this being a butcher murder, the following statement made by Nesbitt discusses the likelihood of that happening. He controlled them absolutely. No one talked. The fear that he instilled in them made sure that they didn't talk. No one knew about their activities. No one was allowed in the Lawnbrook Club when they were discussing tactics. It was simply a completely closed shop. Pathologist Thomas Marshall, responsible for the autopsy report on Francis Crossan, would go on the record to say, He had cutthroat wounds, a number of cutthroat wounds, some of them quite superficial, but uh, some quite deep, going back to the spine. The 34-year-old father of two was nearly decapitated. 
and D.C. Nesbitt noted that even in the Troubles, this murder stood out for its savagery. Crossan had been abducted from the Millfield neighborhood and was held for what is believed to be roughly half an hour before being killed with a butcher knife, his body dumped near the station where D.C. Nesbitt was the head of the Criminal Investigative Division at the time. Three months later, 55-year-old street sweeper Thomas Quinn was the next to fall victim to the butcher's gang. After drinking in a pub in Millfield, Quinn was witnessed being abducted in a black taxi cab, and this taxi cab provides the first potential link to someone in the Shanko Butcher's gang. William Moore, one of Murphy's inner circle, owned a black taxi. But Moore's taxi was one of just seven or eight hundred in the immediate area, and when it was searched, it came back clean. And it was when Quinn was killed in the Glencairn district of Upper Shankill on February 7, 1976, and his body left mutilated to be found, that Lenny Murphy's gang was coined the Shankill Butchers by the press. From that point forward, that name would haunt the daily lives of Catholics and Protestants alike in the North Belfast community, and especially those living in the Millfield neighborhood. Catholics feared they would be targets of his acts, and Protestants feared either being mistaken for Catholic or taken for a rat. I think from then on, there was a fear that had come into the Protestant community, that perhaps we had unleashed something that we would find very, very difficult to curtail. Baroness May Blood, a former member of Parliament for the Labour Party, would say regarding the time period to the BBC. It's okay for outsiders to say, why don't you do this? Why don't you speak up? You don't know if your next door neighbor was involved in this. You don't know what might happen to your kids. You've got to live in the area to know and taste that fear. Blood would say in a matter of fact manner, if people had spoken out, they probably would have found themselves as victims. DCI Nesbitt was no closer to catching the killer, and this was leading Murphy to an even more heightened sense of purpose and righteousness. He was finally standing up for the Protestant community and showing the Republicans that the IRA could not protect their own communities. When Nesbitt was asked if Murphy was on the radar at this point in the investigation, he said the following. He would have been on the radar. He was sort of a cunning boy. We knew he was in the UVF, but he pretty much kept a low profile. It also didn't make matters easier that there were hundreds of men in the area and loyalist paramilitaries that could have conceivably been suspects. And with the total control Murphy had over those carrying out these horrible acts with him, he in turn exercised total control over the investigation into the acts he was carrying out. Jim Campbell a reporter who began writing about the butcher killings around this time was quoted as saying, Well, I had started writing about the butcher gang back in the early 70s, even before people realized there were serial killers on the loose. I was picking up reports about this man who they called a bloody psychopath. They, like many members of the local community, were frightened of him. Not perhaps what he would do himself, but what he was capable of ordering others to do. Campbell went on to say that the problem wasn't so much that it wasn't known who was carrying out the killings, it was more of an issue of proof. We couldn't publish Murphy's name, he said, because we had no proof at the time, just like police at the time had no proof. Still, the police would have known that Lenny Murphy was the leader of the gang. Most people in the Shank Hill Road knew Lenny Murphy, knew what he was up to, and lived in total fear of him. And it was just 15 days after Murphy had taken the life of Thomas Quinn that Francis Ross was taken a few streets from where Lenny Murphy lived at the time. With five other people involved in Ross's killing, two of them women, the Shankill Butchers had taken their third victim. This time, however, 
A butcher's knife was confirmed to have been collected from a loyalist club before the murders were carried out. DCI Nesbitt would claim, though, that Lenny Murphy was not amenable to the hierarchy of the UVF. He kept involved in certain activities with their approval and what they authorized him to do. But when they moved into these cutthroat killings, they became a, a renegade or a breakaway group, and I'm satisfied that the UVF leadership did not know who was carrying out these murders and certainly did not give their approval. This is definitely at odds with the claim of journalist Jim Campbell and seems to be wishful thinking if you ask me. Baroness May Blood would say, I would imagine there would have been at least 30 to 40 percent of the community who knew who the butchers were, but they weren't going to name them. These people got such a grip in the community that there was such fear you didn't cross them. Blood also wondered aloud whether the UVF knew, and I have to believe that if the UVF exercised even an ounce of the control over Protestant communities that the provisional IRA exercised over Catholic communities, it would be highly unlikely that the UVF leadership didn't know and illogical to consider otherwise. These communities were too close for something of this nature to remain secret from those who had influence. It seems to me it was much more likely that UVF and RUC leadership considered the fact that they didn't have enough evidence to place Murphy or his gang under arrest and this allowed them to maintain plausible deniability. It is also widely believed that at this time, the UVF leadership that did know what Murphy and his gang were doing were too afraid to stand up to him, even though many in the community felt the attacks were bringing shame to the Shankill community. This was likely because Murphy's murderous rage also extended to the Protestant, loyalist community as well. After one of the men involved in the initial butcher's killing, the murder of Francis Crossan, had been killed by a rival UVF member, Murphy captured the man, Noel Shaw, strapped him to a chair, pistol whipped him, and then shot him. Just like Murphy's Catholic victims, Shaw was discarded near Shankill Road as well. Then, for unknown reasons, Murphy decided that his next attacks needed to be different. Edward McQuaid, a 25-year-old Catholic man was shot and killed from close range when Murphy jumped from William Moore's taxi on January 10, 1976. But alas, a mistake was around the corner for the butcher's leader, and Lenny Murphy is arrested on March 12, 1976, after he returns to the scene of his attempted murder of a young Catholic girl to retrieve a gun that he left behind. Those in the community that knew Murphy was secretly behind the butcher attacks, although he wasn't being imprisoned for the murders, nevertheless, they were happy that he was being taken off the streets. By this point, 1,634 had died as a result of the Troubles conflict, and this number, combined with the sensationalized press coverage of the gang, likely brought Lenny Murphy to the realization that the butcher murders had to continue while he was behind bars. It would be a real chance for any heat to be shifted away from him at the very least, and so Murphy used two go-betweens, Mr. A and Mr. B, to run his operations on the outside. When Cornelius Beeson was killed, he was butchered so bad that it was said by his brother that his own mother would not have been able to recognize him. North Belfast knew, Northern Ireland knew, whose handiwork this belonged to. Beeson was killed late on August 1st, 1976. We now know his murderers, William Moore and Sam McAllister, used a hatchet to kill the 49-year-old Catholic. Yet while the butcher murders seemed to be destined to continue, Lenny Murphy also seemed destined to spend some time in prison. On October 1977, Murphy was sentenced to 12 years in prison after pleading to a lesser firearms charge. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here because by October 1977, 
Lenny Murphy wasn't the only Shankill Butcher that seemed to be destined to spend some time in prison. By the end of 1976, William Moore had assumed the leadership of the gang's day-to-day -day operation with Murphy behind bars. Moore was going to be responsible for carrying out the future butcher attacks and was being given instructions for Murphy by Mr. A to resume the butcher killings. Stephen McCann, a 21-year-old university student, was out for a night at the Queen's Student Union with his sister, enjoying himself as he should have been just before his life was taken before Moore. He and his girlfriend were walking home through Millfield when it happened. In an interview for a documentary on the Shankill Butchers, James Nesbitt recalls his arrival at the scene of McCann's death. Got out of the car, saw the body lying seven yards up on the ground, walked towards it, and I knew it was another one. It was clear Nesbitt was very much affected by the grief felt by McCann's family after his murder, saying the following, A horrendous experience for them. Tragic. A young man with his whole life in front of him, coming home from a disco, and he is suddenly taken and thrown into the oblivion. No witnesses. No clues. Nothing. Joseph Morrissey was killed just four days after McCann on February 3rd, 1977, found badly beaten and with his throat slashed, and Francis Cassidy just weeks later shot and killed with his throat cut also. The autopsy would show that Cassidy's death was caused by the bullet, with the cutting of his throat potentially contributing to his death. On April 10, 1977, Kevin McMenamin, only seven years old, was killed during a bomb attack while attending an Easter Rising commemoration parade. Exactly one month later, on May the 10th, 1977, the Shankill Butchers would finally make the mistake that would do them in for good leaving Gerard McClaverty while he was still alive, stabbed, badly beaten, and with his wrist cut. Posing as policemen, two members of the gang forced him into their car, where two more members of the gang were waiting. After the attack was carried out in an abandoned doctor's office, the members of the gang, who were suspected to be inebriated when the attacks took place, left Gerard for dead. After Gerard was rescued and treated for his injuries, policemen would drive him around the shank hill until he eventually spotted two of the men responsible for his attacks. It was shortly thereafter that many of the butcher's gang were arrested, including de facto leader William Moore. The Shankill Butchers. The most prolific serial killer group in the United Kingdom would spend most of 1977 through 1979 in prison, eventually convicted and sentenced for the acts that had contributed to the fear of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of residents of Northern Ireland. In February 1979, at the Kremlin Road Courthouse in Belfast, the world's press were packed to the rafters to hear their sentence. Relatives of the accused and victims alike were in attendance. The atmosphere described as crackling with tension. The judge presiding over the trial described the murders as a catalog of horror that would stand as a monument to blind sectarian bigotry. The Shanko Butchers were sentenced to a combined 42 life sentences for their role in 19 murders. This was the largest combined sentence in the history of the United Kingdom. But noticeably, one man was absent. In 1982, Lenny Murphy was released from prison after completing a reduced sentence on his firearms charge. Almost immediately, he went about rebuilding his gang. Murphy had big plans for his new group but it seems that Loyalist leadership was worried about his influence on the community and feared what Murphy would do if he was allowed to return to the activities he was directing before and from prison. It is believed with reasonable certainty that Loyalist leadership 
passed on information to the provisional IRA about Murphy's presumed location on November 16, 1982. At the age of 30 years old, Lenny Murphy was finally met with the justice that the Catholic community had been robbed of when he could not be included in the trial for the Shankill Butcher murders. Before the act could be carried out, it is suspected that Murphy took the lives of three additional Catholics, with his brother John's alleged involvement in at least one of the murders. John is believed to have been Mr. A, the unknown man who served as his brother's go-between to de facto butcher's leader William Moore while Lenny was in prison. Curiously, a newly published book called UVF Behind the Mask claims that John was the real leader of the butcher's gang, not Lenny. It all centers on an unnamed woman who states that she allowed the Shankill Butcher's gang to meet in her home on numerous occasions, and it was in fact John Murphy that the gang feared, and that it was by design that Lenny was to be feared by the public. They tried to say he gave the orders, she said, but he was in jail most of the time. They were that frightened of John. John Murphy died in 1998 in a car crash, and whether he escaped justice as the gang's real leader or just one of Lenny's top lieutenants, he was one more that Catholics feel should have been convicted in the 19 murders that were committed by the group. What's worse, two more of the gang's most important leaders, William Moore and Robert Bates, both of who received life sentences, were out of prison after the Good Friday Agreement between the IRA and Northern Ireland was reached in 1998. And it is because those two members of Murphy's inner circle are freed by the time the British government and the IRA signed the Good Friday Agreement that we are reminded how a man like Lenny Murphy, a serial killer who was suspected of taking part in or directing the murder of up to 30 individuals in the 30 years he spent on this planet, can be buried as a hero, as a loyalist soldier who fought and died for Ulster, who fought and died a martyr. Thank you so much for listening to the first of what I hope to be many episodes of Killer Cases. Take care.